Hi, my name is Gil Hova, and I'm going to teach you how to play my game, High Rise. So High Rise is a game for one to four players. Uh, there's various modes of play, but it's going to take roughly between 90 minutes and 120 minutes uh, based on the mode that you're playing with. So let's get right into what you're trying to do. So in High Rise, you are a building developer. You're trying to build these skyscrapers. You know, some of them are pretty modestly sized and some of them are fairly enormous. Uh, and you are trying to put them onto this city over here. Uh, when you construct buildings, you get points. Uh, the taller the building, the more points you get. You're going to try to get the most points over two or three rounds, depending on the game mode you play. And the player with the most points wins. Uh, so I mentioned there's a few different ways to play. There's the introductory game, the standard game, and the full game. So the introductory game is what I'm going to be teaching you. And you might be thinking, oh, introductory game. I'm at gamer. I can handle it. I can. You can give me the standard game or the full game. No, play the introductory game. Trust me on this one. Um, it's not that the game is especially big or brain melting. It's just that if you start with the standard game or the full game, uh, your game's going to run probably three to four hours. Whereas if you play with the introductory game, it's going to be closer to closer to two hours with for a four player game. Um, and uh, if, if you're all learning and playing for the first time, but once you all get the hang of how to play, then you can move on to the standard game, which will run about 90 minutes to two hours, or you can play the full game, which will be a little longer than two hours, especially if you're all just learning the game. But the more you know the game, the quicker it takes. So we're going to do the introductory game. Uh, because I think it's uh, it's a really useful and quick way to just jump in. Uh, so first we're going to go uh, talk about setup. So uh, here's the board, and it's already gone through setup, but let me show you uh, the important details. Obviously, we've got the game board uh, in the middle of the table, as uh, any good rule book should tell you. We have our four player pieces over here. We also have the sideboard over here, and the sideboard is going to track victory points along the outside edge and corruption along the middle. Uh, we have several buildings over here that are going to be a little out of shot, but I've got buildings uh, ranging from 2 to 15 stories, and you can put them in a jumble if you'd like. Everybody's going to have uh, their own individual player board, and when you have a player board, uh, you're going to draw a random resource from the resource bag. So everybody here has a random resource that they're starting the game with. So we have these tenant tiles all around the board, and they're put into five different neighborhoods. East Garden, Harborside, Downtown, Bayside Heights, and City Center. So you can tell which neighborhood a tile belongs in because you can just look in the back. So at the start, when you're setting up, uh, you're going to take these 15 tiles, and there's going to be three tiles from each neighborhood. Um, and obviously these are the tiles with the orange marks in the upper right. You're going to put them in the proper neighborhood. It doesn't really matter uh, which order they're in. You can set them in randomly, and uh, any order is fine for the game. So I have this board set up for four players, and there's only three tenant tiles per neighborhood. Uh, the fourth tile is blocked off in a four-player game when you're playing the introductory game and the standard game. Uh, so we take these blocker tiles, uh, that's this tile over here that shows uh, that no player marker can go on it, and this tile over here that no, says no building can go here, and each neighborhood has one of these sets of tiles. So we shrink the board down. Now if you play the full game with four players, then you don't play with these blocker tiles, you have all four tenants available. Now, if you're playing with three players, you're going to play in the opposite side of the board, and the three-player game only has three spaces per neighborhood, so you don't even need the blocker tiles. I've also got these bonus tiles set up, and what I did, I drew these bonus tiles. Uh, the bonus tiles look like this. They've got a black background, and on their backs, they show the year that you're in. The three years of the game, the three rounds, are 2010, 2020, and 2030. Uh, this is 2020. We're playing the intro game, so we're only going to play two rounds. The first round is 2020, and the second round is 2030. So you see this says 2020. That means uh, these are the tiles that are going to go out this round. And they go to these spaces all around the board that have these diamonds. 
And some of these spaces are filled in. So this space over here has two uh, floors written over here. That's the girder symbol corresponds to a floor. So I've already drawn two floors and put them there. Uh, for this tile over here, for this bonus space over here, I drew this bonus tile that said take this green token, and the green tokens are what we call ultra plastic. More on that in a second. Uh, so we take the ultra plastic and a random resource, which I've already drawn from the bag, a random floor, and we put that down in this space. And this over here uh, said to take a card number nine and put it nearby, and I've done that, and I've left the tile out, and you'll see why that is in the second. So any of these spaces that have a diamond, and in a three-player game there's going to be fewer spaces, you're going to take random 20-20 tiles and just fill them up, and if they indicate uh, floors are ultra plastic, you can swap out the tile and put in the actual floors and ultra plastic in that spot. Um, and you can just put them sort of next to each other so players know what's in that spot. So those are the bonus tiles over there. You'll notice that these tenant tiles over here have numbers in the black circles over here. So I've taken all the cards of that number and put them near the tenant tiles. And uh, that's going to come in handy a little bit later. Then the next thing I've done over here is I've set up a bunch of stuff within reach for all the players. Um, I have the bases for all the players. So everybody gets uh, several bases that they can put their buildings in. Uh, and they correspond to player colors. Everybody starts with this one construction yard. And you see over here, everybody has an icon over here in their construction yard that indicates that they start with a random floor. So you're going to draw a random floor and put that here. You notice that I have my construction yard set to the standard game. Uh, make sure that it's not set to the full game. The full game is for something else. That's for when you play with three rounds. But when you play only two rounds, you want this set up for the standard game. All right. So I've got the setup for the standard game. I'm player number one. I've got my random floor. I've got my board set up. I've got my sideboard set up. Um, I have just about everything I've set up. Oh, I have one more thing to set up, and that's the blueprints. So over here we have blueprints. Uh, those are up there in the corner of the board. Um, and you see we have two blueprints. We have one for 2020, and we have one for 2030. Now, the one for 2030 is just informational. We don't actually use that one yet, but it's good to know what's going to be coming up. Uh, 2020, that indicates what kind of floors we need to construct buildings this round. We also have blueprint blockers. Those are the small rectangular tiles next to the blueprints, and we're going to be using those as we play the game. So as a last piece of setup is you're going to take a five-story building, so here's a five-story building, and you're going to seed it in one of your player bases, and then you're going to look for the tenant with a number corresponding to what your player order number is, and you can see that on your starting construction yard. So you see here, I am player number one, that means I'm going to go for uh, this tenant that is marked in orange with player number one. So that means I start with this five-story building on the board, and uh, I'm going to take this shipping firm because that is the tenant that I'm connected to. I'm going to get the power of it. So I'm going to take the shipping firm card and I'm going to put it next to my construction yard. And that shows that I have the shipping firm power for later in the game. So now we have this white player who's player number two. And they're going to go all the way over to this, this construction firm because that has the number two. So what's the construction firm do? What you're going to do is you're going to draw one floor from the bag randomly for every construction yard you have in front of you. And you start the game with one construction yard, and of course you can get more. So we're going to draw an extra floor for this player. So now uh, the white player has a red and a purple floor that they can start the game with. And now we go to player number three. Player number three is yellow, and player number three is going to start over here in the overseas electronics supplier. Uh, they're going to just take a black floor out of the bag. Frequently in the game, there's a lot of times when you're just going to look in the bag to draw exactly the floor that you need. In this case, the game tells you to look in the bag and draw a black floor. And we're going to add it to their construction yard, like yay. And then we're going to draw a random floor from the bag. And if that floor that they drew is black, uh, they're going to draw one more floor. And if that floor is black also, they stop. But in this case, we did not draw a black floor. We drew a blue floor, so we stopped. And that's the Overseas Electronics Supplier. All right, and now we have player number four. Player number four is going to start over here in the research firm. 
And the research firm, the power is that they're going to get one Ultra Plastic. Ultra Plastic is really useful in this game. Uh, so player four might be the last player in, in turn order, but they have a pretty nice advantage that they start the game with. Also, I want to point out that the difference between the introductory game and the standard game is that, as you can see in the introductory game, the game told us uh, exactly where to put our buildings. There is no thought to it. Uh, and that speeds up setup, especially when you don't know our tenants for the first time. Uh, but once you know the game, instead of uh, taking these three tenants out, you randomize the tenants. You'll notice that there were uh, nine tenants per neighborhood. And if you're a Kickstarter backer, you got a 10th tenant per neighborhood. So in the standard game, you actually shuffle the tenants, you draw them out randomly, and then everybody drafts them. So uh, starting in reverse player order, you choose the neighborhood you start with, and you choose the tenant that you start with, and you start with that power. So that's really the biggest difference between the introductory game and the standard game. And it's why I recommend that people play the, the introductory game first because you, you're not expected to know all the tenants at the very start of the game. It's a little stressful and annoying to do that. Uh, now, in the full game, you might be wondering, well, what makes the full game different? Well, uh, in this version of the game, the standard and introductory game, uh, you only go two rounds. You start in 2020, then you play 2030, and you're done. Uh, the full game, you play 2010, and then 2020 and 2030. And moreover, you start with nothing on the board and no corruption. So uh, the standard game, the introductory game, kind of bake in an extra round at the start during setup. But I found that the full game is a lot of fun to play uh, because you really can have these wildly different player patterns. And I think if you have the time, it's a really cool way to play the game. But I also wanted an option to play the game at under two hours. So there you have it, the intro game, the standard game, and the full game. So we're all set up now. We all have our little starting buildings on the board. And uh, as you can see over here, these buildings on the board all have player bases. So now these tenants are linked to certain player colors, which is going to come in handy at certain points. Okay, so we are set up for a four-player game, and we can go ahead and we can start playing. So the basic idea behind High Rise is you're going to be moving your piece on the board. This is called your mogul. You're going to be moving it to any one of these available spaces. How do you know it's your turn to move? You know it's your turn to move when you are furthest behind on this track. You see, this is a one-way track all along the board. Each of these white and gray spaces is a space where you can move to. Um, the player furthest behind on the track is the player whose turn it is. You may have played some other games that use this mechanism, but we've got some nice twists in here that I'm looking forward to showing you. So red is going to go as far as they want along the track, like seriously, they can make a huge jump if they want. And wherever they go to, let's say they make a really small jump here, they're gonna execute this action. Once they're done executing this action, then the next player who is furthest behind, that player is gonna go to any unoccupied spot. So they can't go to this spot because it's been taken by red, but they could go to this spot or this spot or this spot or this spot all around the board. Uh, but where, wherever they decide to go, they take that action, and then the next player furthest behind takes their turn. So uh, when you land on a spot, so let's say I land on this spot over here, I'm going to take this action, and there's a lot of these spots that have this briefcase icon on them. The briefcase icon indicates corruption. Corruption is a resource in this game that you can use uh, that gives you a little bit of a boost with certain actions. But just like real life, if you have too much of it, it could come back to haunt you. So occasionally, if you have too much corruption, the game is going to punish you a little bit. Uh, and at the end of the game, there's a rather big VP punishment if you have too much corruption. But if you can manage your corruption and not have the most at the end of the game, you might be able to do really, really well. So you're trying to collect these floors. These are various floors that you can pick up uh, throughout the game. Floors are in this bag. So here are a bunch of floors. And these floors are in five different colors, and they correspond to the colors on the blueprint. So the colors on those blueprints indicate which buildings you can construct using which floors. And remember, you start the game with a floor. What you're trying to do is you're trying to collect floors of the various colors. 
You try to match them to an individual blueprint, and when you do, you can land on one of these spaces with a hook, and that's a construction zone. Uh, so you go to this area, and you can convert uh, those floors they've collected into a real building. You put that building on the board, uh, the building will be linked to a tenant, the tenant will give you a certain power, and then you use that power. And then for the rest of the game, if anybody lands in that space, you're going to draw a random floor because somebody just used your tenant and your building. So that's a general idea of the overview of the game. Uh, we're going to keep on taking turns all around the board until everybody has um, stopped back in the stop zone. It's called the stop zone because you see these various stop signs in here. Uh, you have to stop when you get to this area. You can't pass it. Once all four players have stopped there, uh, then that's the end of the round. You're going to score some bonus points based on the heights of your buildings. Uh, then you're going to move on to the next round. In the leftmost blueprint, if I had these three floors on my construction yard, I could turn them into the bag and I could construct a three-story building. And then that three-story building would give me three victory points. I put it in my player base, and then I would put it somewhere on the board. Now, wait, there's one little extra thing. I'm the first person to construct that blueprint. I know that because there's nothing underneath the blueprint. So what I'm going to do is when I construct the blueprint is instead of getting a three-story building, I'm going to get one extra story in the building. I'm going to get one extra floor. Instead of taking a three, I'm going to take a four. I'm still only going to spend three resources. I'm still going to only spend a red, a blue, and a black, but I'll get a four-story building out of it, which would be four points instead of three. And then I put the four-story building inside a uh, player base, and I put it somewhere out on the board. Then what I do is I block off the plus one space at the bottom of the blueprint, and that indicates to everybody that anyone can continue to build that blueprint, but it no longer gives an extra floor. The remaining blueprints all still give an extra floor, but once somebody builds it, they no longer can uh, get an extra floor out of it. Um, and I started with the leftmost blueprint, but you don't have to. You can build any of the blueprints as long as they're the, they're the blueprints for this round. Again, the 2030 blueprints are visible this round, but they're not available to be built. They're just there in case it's close to the end of the round and you want to see what uh, floors you should pick up for next round. Uh, let me tell you about the rightmost two blueprints. The rightmost two blueprints, you'll notice have... They have a green cylinder on top, and that indicates ultraplastic. So what does that mean? Well, ultraplastic is a revolutionary new building material, and it has three characteristics. The first is that ultraplastic requirement over there is wild. I can fulfill it with any floor I want. I can fill it with a red. I can fill it with a purple. Any color is good. The second characteristic of Ultra Plastic is an Ultra Plastic token, which I can pick up at various spots in the game. This is wild, and this can stand in for any color. So if you go back to that leftmost blueprint, I can build it with a black, a red, and an Ultra Plastic standing in for the blue. That's totally fine. I can use as much Ultra Plastic in a blueprint as I want. So we have these two-way wilds. Uh, ultra plastic on a blueprint means you can use anything you want for that requirement, and an ultra plastic token means you can use it as anything. Now, the third characteristic of ultra plastic is if I use ultra plastic as ultra plastic, that is, if I fulfill that ultra plastic with ultra plastic, I get an extra floor in my building. So that is a five story blueprint. If I fill ultra plastic with ultra plastic, I'll get a six story blueprint out of it. And if I'm first to that blueprint, I'll get a seventh story out of it. So there's a lot of ways in this game that you can actually sneak in extra floors to your building. In this case, I'm only spending five floors, four floors plus an ultra plastic. But if I time it right, I could get seven stories out of it. That's pretty nice. All right, so let me show you what these various spaces on the board do, and as I show you this, I'm also going to tell you about a few other important rules in the game. So, uh, let's start with this spot over here. And I'm just going to move my red marker 
all around to show what each space is, even though once I'm here, technically I wouldn't get another turn. So I move here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look in the bag and I'm going to get a red floor. Okay. Let me do that now. I look in the bag and I take a red floor and I add it to my construction yard. And now if I want, I can draw a random floor from the bag and add that to my construction yard. But if I do that, I must take one corruption. So let's say I do that. I'll draw a random floor. It will turn out to be a blue floor and I'll add that to my construction yard. And I've got my corruption now. Well, what does the corruption mean? Well, for most of the game, it doesn't mean anything until the end of the round. And there's going to be two things that happen at the end of the round. The first thing that happens is we're going to look to see who has the fewest points. So let me just set up a little example here. Let's say red has the fewest points here. Red uh, will lose two corruption because they have the fewest points. That's good for red. Now, white over here has the second fewest points. White will lose one corruption. Now comes the bad part. Blue has the most corruption. Blue is going to go backwards on the corruption track until they hit the next player. So in this case, blue would go backwards one, two, three. Bam, they hit the white player, they stop. That means they're going to go backwards on the VP track the same amount, one, two, three. So uh, that's not great for blue. Blue just lost three points, but they also lost three corruption. That's not really that terrible for them. So it's a trade-off. It's a question of how far do you want to go up in corruption, and do you think you can afford to lose those points? Uh, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. It all depends. That happens at the end of 2020. So let's see how corruption hits you at the end of the game. So at the end of the game, let's say that uh, the board looked like this, that white had the most VP, but white also has a lot of corruption. So at the end of the game, nobody's going to lose corruption. Instead, white has the most corruption. White is going to lose three VP for having the most corruption. Blue has the second most corruption. Blue loses one VP. And now you're going to look at the numbers on the spaces on the corruption track you're on. So for example, white is on the minus nine spot. White is going to lose nine victory points and go down to 30. Blue is going to lose seven points. Blue goes down from 38 to 31. Yellow is going to lose four points. Yellow goes from 36 to 32. And red's going to lose two points. Red goes down here. So... You see, before it was a pretty spread out game, but Corruption tightened it up and Yellow would eke out a very narrow victory in this game. So Corruption can really be a factor, and if you don't have a lot of Corruption at the end of the game, you could set yourself up for a nice finish. But there are times where the Corruption really helps you, so it's your call to make. Also, you'll notice that uh, on the Corruption track, uh, there are some jumps in the numbers, and sometimes people look at that and they think it's a typo. It is not a typo. That is exactly the kind of pain I want you to feel when you are taking corruption. Okay, excellent. So now we can reset this. You'll note that everybody starts at minus two at the start of the game. So I've explained uh, what this spot does. Uh, and now you might be able to figure out what this one does. This is exactly the same thing, only it's for a gray floor instead of a red floor. So this spot over here gives you an ultra plastic, and you can take a random floor from the bag for a corruption. So, I want to point your attention to one more thing about this area. You notice these three action spaces are all connected. This is a zone. So the thing about a zone is each player may only do one thing in a zone. So for example, let's say I'm red. Let's say I go over here and I do this action. Then white goes over here and does this action. And then let's say yellow and blue, they go off and they do something else up ahead. Maybe yellow goes over here and blue goes over here. Great. Now it's red's turn again because red is furthest behind. Since you can only do one action per zone, red cannot go here. Red's first move has to be at least here. So uh, when I'm choosing which of these spots, I have to choose them with care. I can't just make these cheap little jumps. I can only do one action in each zone. You notice this is a zone, this is a zone, this is a zone, and so on and so forth all around the board. We've got this little spot over here on its own, and this is its own little zone as well. 
So now I want to draw your attention to this spot over here. These are the bonus spaces, and bonus spaces are pretty special. Uh, bonus spaces are not spaces you land on. Bonus spaces are spaces you jump over. If you are the first person to jump over a bonus space, let's say I went from here straight to here, I jumped over this bonus space, I get, as, I get everything from one space. So I can take the black floor and the ultra plastic. I could take the gray floor and the black floor. Or I could take card number nine, which I have conveniently placed out here. This is the mayor's office. I'll explain what that is in a second. Now, you might be thinking that the ultra plastic is, uh, and the black floor is strictly better than the black floor and the gray floor, and you'd be right. Uh, sometimes it just comes out this way, and that is maybe in this case what I take, and I'll add them to my construction yard. So now the next player to jump over, like let's say maybe white decides to not jump over, white decides to go over here, but yellow decides to go and jump over here. Uh, yellow now has a choice between the mayor's office and these two floors. So maybe yellow chooses the mayor's office. The mayor's office is a, is a card, a power card, that gives you a one-time power. When you use mayor's office, you're gonna slide your mogul underneath the other player's mogul they are going to go before you. So uh, mayor's office uh, gives you a nice way to take a spot that otherwise would not be available to you. So let's say yellow takes that, and we can just discard the tile. We don't need it anymore once it's taken. And yellow takes the card and keeps it in front of them. So now it's blue's turn, and maybe blue goes ahead over here, and now blue's going to take this last set of resources, and adds it to their construction yard. Now it's white's turn, and as we know, white cannot go here or here because that's all in the same zone. Uh, the first spot white can go to is here, and let's say they do that, they do not get anything from the bonus space because they are the fourth across. And in a three-player game, you'll notice the bonus spaces only have two boxes, so the third player over doesn't get anything. So the bonus spaces give rewards for the players who jump over them earlier. But again, you never land on bonus spaces. You just jump over them and collect whatever's there, if anything. So those are the bonus spaces. Um, I want to point out one other thing that can happen. In the example before, I had yellow landing on this spot. Yellow would take the shipping firm action, but you'll notice that yellow landed on red's space. Red would draw one random floor from the bag uh, because somebody landed on their space. So that's sort of a global rule in the game. If somebody lands on your space on one of your buildings, you get to draw a random floor. It doesn't matter what the power is. You don't get the power. The player who landed there gets the power, but you get a random floor. Now you might be wondering what happens when this happens. What happens when you land on your own building? Well, you may take a floor, but because you are clearly embezzling, you would also have to take a corruption. So it's up to you uh, whether or not you want to go ahead and, and do that. Is a floor worth a corruption? That's gonna be your call. Now you'll also notice, this is what my construction yard looks like so far. And you notice I only have seven spaces in my construction yard. I've got two spaces free. What happens when my construction yard fills up? Let me just give you an example. What happens when my construction yard fills up? Okay. If it ever overflows, if my construction yard, if I ever get another floor in my construction yard, I need to put this red floor somewhere. Well, I've got a choice. I can either discard a floor, maybe I'll discard this floor over here. And that's fine, that's a thing I can do. The other thing I can do is I can get a new construction yard, okay? So the new construction yard here is five extra spaces, and if you ever need a construction yard, you can immediately take one. The only downside to a new construction yard is corruption. You will get corruption when you get a new construction yard. In 2020, you get two corruption, in 2030, you get one corruption. And if you're playing the full game in the first round, 2010, you'd get three corruption. But the construction yard comes to you immediately. You don't have to do any special actions for it, but you may only take that new construction yard when you are overflowing.
Okay, so let's talk about some of these spaces on the board here. We're getting to the first of the tenants. So let's say I go over here to the shipping firm. I get a shipping firm card. In this case, I had started with a shipping firm card, so I would get a second shipping firm card. What does that mean? So the shipping firm is, if I ever draw randomly from the bag, I can flip over the shipping firm card to draw randomly from the bag again. I have two shipping firms, which means I can activate this twice. I draw randomly from the bag. Let's say somebody used my building, um, and then I use a shipping firm. I draw twice. I could use another shipping firm and draw a third time. But, and you knew there was going to be a but, if I ever use multiple cards of the same name on the same turn, corruption. You got one corruption for every extra card I'd use. So if I use a second shipping firm card, I'd get one corruption. So that's the shipping firm. And notice you flip it over. You unflip the shipping firm at the start of the next round, at the start of 2030. So you get to use it once every round. Now we've got a .com as the next spot. The .com is a tenant that if during construction, you ever get an extra floor, and remember, you can get extra floors during construction, either by being first to a blueprint or by matching ultra plastic. If you ever get an extra floor, you draw a random floor from the bag. Of course, if I have a .com and a shipping firm, and I get to draw randomly using the .com, I can draw a second floor using my shipping firm. So these tenants do all chain together. The third thing here is an insurance company. For the insurance company, if you ever lose corruption, and there are several spots on the board where you can lose corruption, there is one there. There is a bonus over there that lets you lose corruption. And uh, the stop spaces on the board let you lose corruption as well. So if I ever lose corruption, I get to draw randomly from the board. Now you notice the insurance company is an X1 card. You only get one use out of it, and then you return it to supply right next to the board. So those are the three tenants over here in East Gardens. We've got a few more spots where you can get uh, floors. You can get a black floor over here. You can get a purple floor over here. You can get a blue floor over here. And in any of these spaces, you can take a corruption and get a random floor. And remember, if you have a shipping firm, you can always draw randomly a second time. You can start to see how the synergies work in this game. And that gets us over to our first construction zone. So a construction zone, as you'll remember, allows you to construct a building. Let's say my construction yard looked like this. I could build the second one. Obviously, if I had a red, blue, and a black, I could build the first uh, blueprint again. In this example, since somebody's already built it, I'd only get three stories out of it, not four, uh, because I wouldn't get the extra floor somebody's already built there. But here, uh, I can convert these floors. I can pay these floors back to supply back to the bag, and I would get the second blueprint, which is normally four stories, but since I'm first to it, I would get a five-story building, and that would be 5 VP, and I would take this, and I would put this anywhere on the board that I wanted, but obviously there's a catch. You notice this thing over here? It says corruption unless constructing in East Gardens. So there are two free spots in East Gardens. I can go here or here, build in the insurance company or the dot-com, and wherever I build, I get that power. So if I build, say, a dot-com, I get a dot-com card. However, I can build outside East Gardens. Like, for example, maybe I want to build over in Harborside, and that gets me a high-end condo, and a high-end condo gets me a special power, which I'll explain in a little bit. So I do get that power. I can build any open spot on the board. But if I build outside East Gardens, I have to take another corruption. So constructing buildings can give you corruption. Now you notice this spot over here. This also lets you construct buildings. So maybe red is over here and yellow really wants to build. So yellow can go here and yellow can construct a building as well. But just landing here would give yellow a corruption. And then there's this spot over here. White or blue can land here, and they can get a uh, construction action, but they would have to take two corruption in order to do that. Uh, and once somebody's in there, nobody else can construct a building unless somebody snagged a mayor's office. So that's construction. I want to point out one more thing. So over here in East Gardens, 
We have red with a five-story building. We have blue with a four-story building. And we have white with a seven-story building. So East Gardens is now full. Now, when a neighborhood is full, you can still build in that neighborhood, but you must be taller than the shortest building. So the shortest building in this case is Blues 4. That means you must build five stories or higher in order to go to East Gardens. If you do that, you're actually going to blow up Blues 4. Blue will get two random floors from the bag as compensation for losing their building. Let's say Yellow did that. Now Yellow has a five-story building in East Gardens. Now there are two buildings that are shortest. If you want to construct in East Gardens again, you now must build six or taller. Which building do you blow up? It's up to you. Now there are times when maybe the buildings here are too tall for you to build. Maybe in this case, the tallest building you want to build is four stories, but you don't want to take corruption for it. Uh, and you don't want to go outside East Gardens. So what you can do is you can build that four-story building, but you don't take a building tile. You don't put it anywhere on the board. You just spend your four floors or however many floors you're going to spend, whatever you match the blueprint with, and you score your victory points, and then you're done because you've built the building in the suburbs and nobody cares. I want to also point out that there is a fifth neighborhood called the City Center. It's always available to be built on, but you'll notice that these construction zones, uh, this one is one corruption unless you build in East Gardens. This one is one corruption unless you build in Harborside. This one is one corruption unless you build downtown. And then back over here in the stop zone, it's one corruption unless you construct in Bayside Heights. Uh, so first off, when you uh, finish a round, you're guaranteed a build. And second off, uh, each of the neighborhoods has an area that you can build with no corruption, except city center. So what that means is you can always build in city center, you're just always going to take a corruption for it. At least if you're playing the intro game. If you're playing the standard game, there are some tenants that help you with that. Okay, so we're done with this construction zone, and at this point you know most of the game. Uh, these three bonus spots. This over here, this is a card called an archive. An archive lets you refresh a card. So if you have any face down cards, you can discard archive and flip the card face up and get a second use out of it this round. Or when you use a card that's marked 1x, like our friend the insurance company we saw before, I could use the insurance company, like I lose corruption and I get two floors. I can discard the, uh, the archive instead of the insurance company when I use insurance company, and I can use it again later. In fact, I can use it again immediately, but since I'm using this, a second card of the same name in the same turn, I would get corruption. So, let's go to the next sets of uh, tenants. The research firm, we already saw what it does during setup. Whoever goes here gets one ultra plastic. The high-end condo, uh, we got a glimpse of it before. When you construct, you can use the high-end condo to add any two floors you want from your construction yard to any blueprint. So you're pretty much adding whatever two floors you want to a blueprint, but you must have those floors in your construction yard. So one more thing about high-end condo. Let's say I built a building and I put it here in high-end condo. And let's say for argument's sake, I've got an extra, a couple of extra floors in my construction yard. And since I've, I've built over here, I now have a high-end condo card. Well, now I can immediately spend the high-end condo card that I just got, spend these two floors, and now the seven-story building that I just bought will become a nine-story building. And in general, uh, the game lets you do stuff like this. You can immediately use stuff that you get when you build. The only rule is you can't use it to modify or add to uh, the floors that you use to spend on the blueprint itself. So the blueprint itself, you have to have everything when you construct, but after that, you can use the powers any way you want. It's pretty forgiving. So the next tenant over here is the Taxi Cap Commission. First off, you'll notice that when you land on a taxicab commission, or if you build on the taxicab commission, 
you'll immediately get two victory points just by doing that. Then you get a Taxi Cab Commission card, and what this does is it lets you break the rule that normally you can't go do a second action in the same zone. So maybe later on, maybe later on I'm here, and it's my turn, and I really want to go here. I'm not allowed to normally, but I can spend a Taxi Cab Commission to do that. So that can come in really handy sometimes. Now, just to note that the Taxi Cab Commission doesn't let you go out of turn. You still have to be the furthest behind in order to take your turn. It just lets you break a rule. Now let's look at some of these spots coming up. This spot over here, and you'll see this spot repeated at several points in the board. So this one lets you trade as many floors as you want of one color for that number of a different color. For example, so let's say my construction yard looked like this. Now I'll, I want to build that really big blueprint. It takes an ultra plastic, a black floor, two purple, a gray, and a blue. Now I've got everything except I've got two red floors instead of two purple floors. So if I go here, I can trade my two red floors in, I can get two purple floors, and later on I can land in a construction zone and I can construct the tallest building. And hopefully I'm the first one to, to sneak in that extra floor. Now, you're not obligated to trade in all floors of a color. So if you have three floors of a given color, you can choose to trade just two of them, for example. So whatever you trade, you get that number back. For example, if I trade two reds, I can get two of any one color. But I can't trade, say, a red and a green for uh, two grays, for example. Uh, I have to give out one color and I have to take in one other color. Now, the next thing over here, this icon over here means and or. I can trade and or I can choose any floor from the bag I want for one corruption. Now this is a choice, it's not a random draw. I can look in the bag and I can take whatever color I want, but I gotta take a corruption for that. This next spot over here is a spot that lets me lose two corruption. If I have an insurance company, that means that uh, I can use this when I land on the space to also draw two floors, two random floors. This is another construction zone over here. There's another set of bonus spaces over there. Nothing you haven't seen before, except that uh, one of those bonus spaces lets me lose a corruption. Now we get to that corner space, and that corner space is really interesting. So what that corner space means is if I land there, if I let's say I land in the first spot, I get to draw a random floor from the bag, I get to choose any floor I want from the bag, and then I may take a corruption to choose one more floor from the bag. There are two more spaces in there, that zone. They do exactly the same thing, but you notice they each have a corruption, which means if you land in one of those two spaces, you must take a corruption just to do the action, plus the corruption you may choose to take uh, in order to choose any floor you want. Now we got the next three tenants in downtown. We have a construction yard. Construction yard lets you draw random floors from the bag, one for every construction yard you have. And obviously you start the game with a construction yard, but maybe at this point you've taken an extra construction yard. In this case, I would draw two random floors. Then we have over here, we have a casino. So the casino over there, what you're gonna do is you're gonna draw random floors from the bag. And you'll wanna draw them just right in front of you on the table. After you draw, you can choose to stop or you can draw a second floor. And then when you draw a second floor, if it's the same color as the first floor you drew, you go bust. Now you keep the floors that you drew, but you get two corruption. So let's say I'm using the casino. I draw one floor randomly. Now I can choose to stop or I can draw a second floor randomly. Okay, if I had drawn a second red, I would have gone bust. I would take two corruption, but I would still keep everything I drew. In this case, I drew a black floor, which is different. That's good, I can continue. Now if I draw, if I choose to draw a third floor and it turns out to be red or black, I keep all the three floors that I drew, but I take the two corruption for going bust. In this case, I'm gonna choose to draw again, and it's another black, I go bust, I keep all my floors, and I get two corruption. And that's the casino. The last tenant over there is trade union. Trade union, you choose any floor you want from the bag, and then you may take a corruption to choose any other floor from the bag. Then we've got a trade space, then we've got a lose two corruption space, 
And then we've got, again, uh, an ultra plastic space. Then we've got another construction zone. Then we've got another set of bonus spaces. So let's talk about the bonus spaces over here. They're exactly the same, except this 12 card over here, which is a penthouse. You can use a penthouse at the end of your turn, and it must be at the end of your turn. You discard the penthouse, and you can discard up to three floors from your construction yard, and add that number of floors to any building you want on the board, which is probably gonna be one of your buildings. So if I have, say, a nine-story building, and I've got three floors in my construction yard that aren't doing anything, I can spend a penthouse and turn the nine into a 12. And then I have to spend those three floors for my construction yard. I don't score points for those floors, but I do get a taller building. And remember, taller buildings are good because there's a tallest building bonus at the end of the round. So now we've got another trade spot. We have an overseas electronic supplier, and we saw how that worked at the start of the game. Uh, you get a black floor, you draw a random floor. If it's another black floor, you draw one more floor. And then Engineering Firm gives you an elevator. So elevators are pretty cool in this game. The way that elevators work is when you construct a building, you spend an elevator card, and you get one point for every three floors in that building rounded up. You can only use elevators when you construct a building. So let's say I construct a 10-floor building. I can spend an elevator card and get four points. Remember, everything in the game, every fraction, rounds up. Lastly, we have Metal Importer. A Metal Importer gives you a Spire. A Spire, you're going to put next to your construction yard. It does not take up a spot in your construction yard. If I construct a building, let's say I construct a nine-story building, I can add a Spire that I got previously to a building I'm constructing now. And you see it adds two floors to the building. And now I've got an 11-story building. I don't actually score these two extra floors. They're virtual floors because nobody can actually live in them. But in terms of the tallest building bonus at the end of the round, this is considered to be an 11-story building. You might wonder, can I put a spire on top of another spire? And the answer is, of course you can. This would be a 13-story building and so on and so forth. Now, I want to draw your attention to the city center because we haven't covered those tenants yet, the tenants in the city center tend to give you some pretty good powers. For example, we have the obelisk. This is nice and simple. You just get three extra points when you build an obelisk. This one over here is the highway office. This one's really cool. The way the highway office works is after you construct the highway office, you look to see how many floors you have in your construction yard. You get one point for every floor in your construction yard to a maximum of five. It can be very useful. Lastly, we have the district attorney. So if you use a district attorney, you lose three corruption. Now, since the tenant is in your city center, that means you probably had to take a corruption to actually go in there. So effectively, you net minus two corruption. But then you can choose to spend a floor from your construction yard. If you do, everything's good. If you don't, everybody else will lose one corruption. You are essentially paying off the DA. And that leaves us with the stop zone. When you get to the stop zone, you must stop in the first available spot. So if it looks like this, I have to stop in this area. That's good because I would lose two corruption just for stopping here. And then I can construct in Bayside Heights for no corruption or anywhere else for one corruption. We've got the next two spots where you lose one corruption and the final spot, you don't lose any corruption but you may construct regardless of what spot you go into. So maybe now everybody's back home, everybody's back in the stop zone. In this case, it's the end of the round. So at the end of the round, there's a few things you're gonna do. The first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna do a tallest building bonus. And you've got a little reference in the upper right of your construction yard that tells you the tallest building bonus at the end of the round. Specifically at the end of 2020, Whoever's got the tallest building in a neighborhood is going to get two points, and the second tallest gets one point. This applies for each neighborhood and the whole game. So you're going to look at each neighborhood one by one, two points for tallest, one point for second tallest, and you're also going to look at who is the tallest building in the whole game. They get two points, second tallest gets one point. Now, I might be wondering what happens in case of a tie. In case of a tie, all ties in this game are what I call ultra-friendly. So let's say 
white and yellow were tied for tallest building. White and yellow would each get two points. Then let's say red is second with a five-story building. Red would still get one point for second place. And that's what I mean by ultra-friendly ties. Now at the end of the game, there's a similar bonus, except it's three, two, one. So it's three for tallest, two for second tallest, one for third tallest. Then at the end of the round, you're going to do that corruption adjustment I mentioned earlier, where whoever has the fewest points loses two corruption, whoever has the second fewest points loses one corruption, and then the player with the most corruption loses corruption and VP. And if you look in the upper left of your player board, uh, you'll see a graphic for that. Now, if this were the end of the game, it would be a little different. You'd get that tallest building bonus that I mentioned, and then everybody gets one point for every three floors of their construction yard, again, rounded up, all fractions of the game round up. Then, whoever has got the most corruption loses three points, whoever has second most corruption loses one point, and then everybody loses points for where they are on the corruption track. At this point, you should know enough to start a three or four player game of high rise. If you want to know how to play two players, there's a couple more extra rules. I'll explain them in a moment. So let's talk about the one player game and the two player game. The one player game and two player game use something called a neutral mogul. So I have a setup over here for a two player game. Uh, and if you play one or two player, you're going to play the full game. Uh, you're going to play all three rounds, and the board is going to start with nothing on the board, and nobody's going to start with any corruption. Now, what's going to happen here is uh, yellow's going to take their turn. Maybe yellow goes here um, and gets a red floor, and then blue takes their turn. Maybe they go here, and they get one of these bonus uh, spaces, and they get a shipping firm. Now it's red's turn. But this is a two-player game. Red is a neutral mogul. You notice that uh, the yellow player has that red marker over there. What that means is red is in control of the neutral mogul right now. So red has a choice. Red can either block, uh, and blocking means you're going to move the neutral mogul up to a spot, uh, the next zone ahead of the lead player in the first action spot. So blue is the lead player. First zone ahead of that is this one. First spot is here. So if you block, you move the marker over here, and then yellow would give the red marker over to blue, and blue would be in control of the neutral player. But the other thing that yellow can do is move. And what move means is yellow can now take uh, one corruption and may move, may move this marker to any legal spot and get whatever uh, they land on as if it was their own spot. Now, they can't take any bonus tiles when they move a neutral marker, but uh, you could go, say, over here to the .com, take a .com, and then go on. Uh, the furthest you can move a neutral marker using the move action is either the neighborhood you're in or the next neighborhood over. So since uh, red started over here, the furthest red could go is this zone. Uh, so you can't just bury the neutral marker all the way at the end because that's not interesting. So um, red can go over, say here, take a dot .com, uh, take a corruption, and then pass the, the neutral player marker over to blue. Uh, and now yellow would get their standard turn. So there may be times when he can get multiple turns and he can chain things up in really interesting ways in the two-player game. Uh, so the two-player game, the way the neutral mogul is... Even though it's uh, some people don't like a dummy player, the way it works in this game is actually kind of cool because you can choose whether you ch you take a corruption to move the neutral mogul or maybe you don't want to take the corruption. Um, it's a head-on-head -head race for corruption, so corruption rules work a little differently. I'll let you look in the rule book for that one. That's a general overview of how the two-player game works. Now, the one-player game is similar, except the one-player game, it's just you and two neutral moguls. And I'm not going to go into detail about the one-player game here. You can check the rules for that. But uh, the way it works is every round you're going to put neutral buildings out on the board. Um, and there's going to be a set pool of neutral buildings that you draw from. Then you get to go and then you choose to move or block with the next two neutral moguls. And then on and then on. There's some also some interesting things in with the solo game. You'll notice that 
the blueprint tiles over there uh, have letters on them, and the letters only apply for the solo game. So uh, you'll also notice that uh, these blueprint blocker tiles have a letter on the other side. So anytime any marker passes a construction zone, and you may want to keep the blueprint blockers by a construction zone just to remind you, the first time any of uh, these markers pass a construction zone, you're going to shuffle these tiles and you're going to draw a random one. Whatever you draw, you're going to block that letter. So I drew A randomly, I would block A. But if I had drawn D randomly, I would block D. So obviously that means you'd no longer get the extra floor from building that blueprint that corresponds to D. And you're going to draw one of these every time uh, any marker lands or passes a construction zone and nobody builds there. Now, if you are the first to land in a construction zone and you build there, then uh, you don't have to draw a random blueprint. When it gets around to the end, there will most likely be only one spot left. You're going to score one point for every corruption you are under that number. But if you're over that number, you're gonna lose three points for every number you're over. And if you're even, nothing happens. So that number is going to change from one round to the next, and it's gonna get more and more difficult as the game goes by. So you really need to keep an eye on, the cor on your corruption in a solo game. And that is a quick overview of how to play High Rise. I hope you enjoy the game.